Good morning, City Light Church, and welcome. We're so happy you're here with us today. And if you're new here, we wanna let you know that we are a church where everyone is welcome, no one is perfect, and anything is possible. And we're moving people from where they are to where God wants them to be. Please fill out a connection card or go to our website, citylightgmb.com, and fill out our connection form on there. This week is the last week to take part in our 21 days of prayer or the Greater Things offering. If you're interested in either of those, you can find more information on our website. The reason both of these are ending is because next Sunday, January 24th, is our second birthday as a church. Please come out and celebrate all God has done here in the past year, and we want to invite you to invite someone else to join us for the celebration. We've also recently started a Following Jesus class. If you're looking to propel your faith forward, join us before the service on Sunday at 9.30 a.m. We're also going to be having a youth night January 31st. If you have middle or high school students, bring them out for a night of worship, fun, food, and time with God. And then we're going to be having a Next Steps class on the first Sunday in February. If you're new and looking to learn more about our church, join us immediately following the service on that Sunday. Thank you for joining us today. Please stay connected with us through the week online at citylightgnv.com or on Facebook and Instagram at citylightgnv. Now let's open our hearts and worship the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Good friendly wave. <laughs> All elbows up. And if you're tuning in online, just put a little wave emoji in the chat. To say hello. But we're so glad that you are here joining us today. Let's sing this out this morning. Just one word. Just one word. You calm the storm that surrounds me. Just one word, the darkness has retreat. Just one touch, I feel the presence of heaven. Just one touch, my eyes were open to see. Jesus, and I will believe for 
greater things there's no power like the power of jesus let faith arise let all agree there's no power like the power of jesus Good news. 
Father, thank you for giving us this time today to gather in your name and to praise you, God, and to listen to your word and learn more about you, God. I pray that you have um, prepared the hearts in this congregation, Lord. I pray that you have put a blessing over Josh's message today and that we would hear it and learn it and use it in our lives, God. I pray that you would watch over us and keep us in the days to come. Amen, amen. I am who you say I am. Tell somebody next to you it's good to be in church this morning. I am who he says I am. You can take a seat if you haven't already. It's good to be here this morning. I'm trying to get this to balance for some reason. This is it. Jeff, my microphone is hot. I'm not sure if you hear that or not, but I'm getting some feedback up here. Well, good morning to everybody in the house and good morning to everybody online. We're so glad that you're, you're joining us here at the beginning of a, of a new year. And I just want to say, if you're, if you're just joining us online, would you type in the chat just where you're, you're from? I know we've got some uh, friends and family, extended family joining us in South Florida, uh, some people over in West Florida. I think we might have some people joining us today from Minnesota. I don't know. So that'd be pretty cool if that was the case. So just let us know where you're from. We're glad that you're here. And the, the Holy Spirit is moving in this room. His truth is already being proclaimed our, over our lives. We're already experiencing his presence and his change. And I'm excited about what God's word has for us today because we believe this. It's good to see you, Brittany. It's, uh, we believe that every time we open up our hearts to God's word that he wants to speak to us. And so I'm just feeling and sensing a spirit of unity among us today that we want God to speak. Uh, if you missed last week, we started a new three-part series looking at the Old Testament book of Haggai. And Haggai, as we found out, was a minor prophet uh, during the days of, of when the people of God had gone into captivity. So we went all the way back to King Solomon's temple days. And King Solomon had built this amazing ornate, magnificent temple, and people would travel from all over the world to see the site and to worship in this very special place. And over time, after King Solomon died, the people's hearts drifted away from God. And they, they started worshiping idols. And before long, King Solomon's temple went from being this active place of worship to more of a, you know, uh, just this monument, this, this, this thing of the past. And God wasn't okay with that. And so he allowed some events to happen in the lives of his people to turn the people's heart back to him. And you'll recall we talked about this last week. In 587 B.C., King Nebuchadnezzar, he takes his, his army from Babylon and they destroy Judah. And to add insult to injury, they destroy King Solomon's temple. This amazing, amazing place that even historians to this day still talk about. And not only do they uh, destroy the temple, but they take everyone into captivity for five decades. For 50 years, the people are living in captivity. So you can only imagine the sense of relief, the sense of hope that the people had bubbling up in them when they find out that the governor is going to allow 50,000 of them, a remnant of the people, to return back to their homeland. And the first thing on, this, on the heart of these people is we are going to rebuild our temple. We're going to get back to the way things used to be. We're going to be faithful to our God. We're going to be worshiping him. And we're going to be known as a people of worship. And so you, you'll recall last week, they built the foundation as soon as they got there, cleared off all the rubble, started to build the foundation, and they built an altar and not, soon at, not too long after that, the whole thing came to a halt when they... Uh, they experienced just the smallest of bit of uh, resistance. The Samaritans showed up and said, what are you doing? You can't be doing that. And so they just stopped. And for 14 years, this remnant of people who had all these great ambitions and these, these things they wanted to do, they stopped the work. And God's temple was no longer being taken care of. And they started working on their own houses and not, not God's house. And so God raises up Haggai our prophet, and he wants Haggai to communicate to the people that now is the time to get back to work. Don't focus on your house. 
focus on God's house. Let's put God first. That's, that's the context of where we're going to be today. If you've got your Bibles, Haggai chapter 1, verses 13 and 14 is where we're going to start. Haggai 1, 13 and 14. And this is what the scripture tells us. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message of the Lord to the people. And he said, and let's say this aloud. This is really good news. God said what? God said, I am with you. Let's say that again. If you're joining us online in Minnesota, say it there on your couch. God said what? I am with you. We're going to come back to this thought later on in our time together. I am with you, declares the Lord. Then verse 14. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, the spirit of Joshua, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest, and the spirit of the whole remnant of the people. So what do we see as we look at this text? That God stirs up the spirit of the governor, the high priest, and all the people. And I love this because Haggai wanted us to know that God stirred up their spirits, that God was moving on the earth, that God was, was making a way, he was doing something special. And so my prayer today is that God would stir our spirits. If God can step into time and stir the, the spirits of his people during Haggai's day, we can pray and we can believe that God would stir our spirits, that he would move us from where we are to where God wants us to be. And that's what God does for his people here in Haggai. And he gives them a sense of calling, a divine direction. Now, for those of you who are followers of Jesus, you know this. That just at some point in your life, maybe regularly, I don't know, but just out of the blue, you will sense a purpose that I'm supposed to do this thing. I'm supposed to do that thing. I'm supposed to turn the van around, roll down the window, and give the man the pizza I'm supposed to do that. And if you missed last week, that went right over your head. Um, but you missed a good one. You should have been here. <laughs> the point is, is there will be times that God will alter your plans. There will be times that he stirs up your spirit. And that's what Haggai tells us. He said, God stirred up their hearts and they began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty. And they're, they're working fully believing that we can do this. We've got this. I've got faith. Yes, I do. I've got faith. How about you? And the other team, I've got faith. Yes, I do. I've got faith. How about you? And they fully believe they can do the job that God is calling them to do. And then a month goes by. A month. And guess what happens? The people stop. The work stops. They quit again. They fizzle out. And we find out that at one of their big religious festivals, all the people, the nation of God, they'd all gather together, and they're at the site of the temple, the construction site, and reality hits. Uh, the reality on the ground smacks them in their face, and they see the progress so far, and they're like, this is pathetic. This is all we've got to show for our work. This is embarrassing. And this giant cloud of discouragement settles in over God's people, and they quit. Done. They drop their shovels. They walk away from their wheelbarrows. And all the excitement and all the momentum just fizzles out. And I don't know about you, but I can't handle a quitter. I can't stand a quitter. So little respect for a quitter, like some, some, some man who just walks out on his family and quits because something got too hard or there was a, a better option over here. I can't, I can't handle a quitter or someone who's been your friend and then you go through hard times, right? And they quit on you. And you're like, what? I, can't, I can't handle a quitter. Maybe the reason I can't handle a quitter is because I don't like the quitter in me. I, I don't like when I give up, when I quit, and maybe you could relate because we've all been there. Where we set out to do a thing, we set out to, to accomplish a mission, we're going to attack it, we're going to achieve it, we're going to slay it, make it happen, and then everything just flames out before we ever really get started. 
And uh, by the way, to all the men and the husbands in the room, I'm not talking about putting away the Christmas lights this year. Like, I understand if you quit doing that. Like, like <laughs> that's just a God's timing type thing, right? Just wasn't God's timing. Uh, I get that. Uh, but anyway, uh, God's people, they quit right here in the text. And they were gung-ho. They were ready to go. Let's do this. Let's build this building. It's going to be easy peasy, lemon squeezy. And one month later, to the day, and we know this because they kept good records, to the day, they flame out. And I, I don't know what it might be for you. Maybe you decided, I'm going to get out of debt. Let's do this. Let's get out of debt. No longer going to be slave to the lender. Oh, wait, Christmas is coming. I, I got to do my shopping. Like December surprised me again. I'm, I've got to, I've got to do my shopping. Or, or you were going to get on this diet plan. You're like, here it is. This is the time. I'm, I'm going to, I'm, we are going to lose weight. We're going to be healthy. Uh, but then you discovered that a, a, a package from your aunt came late from Christmas and you got this whole fudge thing came in, right? Like, the diet can wait, and double stuffed Oreos were on sale at Publix BOGO. So, uh, amen. We, we could just hold up on this. We've all been there. Maybe you decided this year I'm going to go to the gym and I'm going to get chiseled, I'm going to get ripped. You know, now is the time, you know, seize the day. And then February, right? Like, if you, if you just make it past February 1st, you will beat the most people, uh, most of the people who go to the gym. It's just, it's true. We tend to quit. We quit. So we've all been there. We've got good intentions. We're off to a great start. And then we don't make the progress that we think we should make. We look in the mirror and we say, ah, I'm not seeing it. You know, I don't know if this is worth all the work. And that's exactly what happens to the people of God. They're like, let's build this temple. They're off to a great start. And then one month in, things didn't go the way they expected. They got incredibly discouraged and they quit. So Haggai, he asks them a question that to me is, is a loving question. Uh, to me, it's, it's, it's as if God is trying to get to the root of their discouragement and help his children. And if you are discouraged today, Perhaps you're discouraged because of the two reasons raised in this question that Haggai asks. This is Haggai chapter 2, verse 3. So Haggai asks the people on behalf of God, who of you is left, who of you is left that saw the house in its former glory? In other words, who of you is old enough to remember Solomon's temple? Wasn't it amazing? And you look at yours and he says, how does how does that look to you? How does it look to you now? Does it seem to you like nothing? Who of you remembers the former, former temple and its amazing glory? Does, does this one look like nothing to you? Two causes of discouragement in this passage that I struggle with, and maybe you do too. If you're taking notes, the first is comparison, and the second is a lack of progress. Comparison and a lack of progress. These people were doing what I so often do. They were comparing their start with someone else's finish. That they were comparing the things that they were attempting to do, their little meager attempt at a temple, to Solomon's amazing temple, the memories that they had of it. In fact, Bible scholars estimate that Haggai was somewhere between 70 and 75 years old when he wrote this book. Which means if you subtract his 50 years of living in captivity from his age, we can guesstimate that he was probably a teenager, maybe 15 years old when they were taken into captivity. So he would have had firsthand memories. He could, he could think back and say, I remember what Solomon's temple looked like. And for those who were too young to remember, they had the stories, right? The stories from their grandparents and their parents. And I'm sure that they were probably, you know, a little, like the fish always gets bigger as you tell the story. So it was, they were grand stories. And it was comparison. And I don't know about you, but I can really get discouraged when I compare myself to someone else. And some of us guys, we are, we are really bad at this. We really are. Like if you've got some friends maybe on social media that you haven't seen for a long time and you look back at their life, you're like, dang, look at their house, you know, look at their car, look at their job. 
Amazing. And, like, and, and my job stinks. I would quit if I could. And my car, I have, it's in the shop every month, and I'm, I don't own my house. I'm renting on the wrong side of town. And we get into this comparison. And, and maybe you ladies, maybe you don't compare yourself to other ladies, but you compare your kids, right, to a, another lady's kids. And her kids all go to school with these perfect, perfect matching outfits uh, with little baked goodies in their lunch, and they're, they're getting college credit right now, and they're in the fifth grade, right? And, 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 and you look at your kids, you know, like, I don't even know if they're wearing pants when they left today, and they lost their lunch money, and they're failing PE, right? And, and just a little bit of comparison, and we can get discouraged really quickly, like, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? And that's exactly what God's people did. Look at our little pathetic attempt at a temple. It just pales in comparison to the glory of Solomon's temple. We're failures. We feel so discouraged. And so comparison causes discouragement, but so does a lack of progress. And maybe you're saying to yourself, you know, this is the year I'm going to get on my diet. I'm going to get back in shape. A new year, new me. And for a whole month, You've been eating nothing but almonds and kale, and you stepped on the scale this morning, and you were two pounds heavier. And that's discouraging. Or you're like, this semester, I am going to get my GPA up. And and so you spend late nights in the library with your nose in a book, and you're skipping out on the weekend trips to the beach so you can study in the dorm. And then you get an email from your professor saying, hey, uh, you know, tutors are available. We can help out. And... No, it just hurts. It's discouraging. And it feels like you take two steps forwards just to take three steps back. And it feels like I'm trying to make progress, but I'm not seeing it. It's discouraging. I'm trying my best. And this is what the people of God were feeling in Haggai. And they had come to the point of asking, is it even worth it? Is it even worth it? And there are those of you that in some category of your life right now, that's what you're thinking. Is it even worth it? I'm giving it all in my marriage, Josh. I'm going way beyond the call of duty. And they aren't even trying. Is it even worth it? I'm discouraged. Some of you, it's your kids. You've been praying for your kids, giving them good advice. You're doing everything that you know to do to help them make good decisions. And you're like, could they be any stupider? How does one make such bad decisions? And it's discouraging. And you can see the life that they're headed into. And you're like, I've been there. You don't have to make the same mistakes I made, but they're not going to listen to you. And you feel discouraged. It could be any number of things spiritually. Maybe ever since you became a Christian, you've struggled with this one haunting sin. And it just comes back at you and comes back at you. And you feel like you can't overcome it. You take two steps forward and three steps back. I can't overcome it. Is it even worth it? Maybe in your office, you work harder than everyone else. And you've been passed up for promotion time and time and time again. And it's discouraging. In the text today, the people are discouraged. And I think most of us can relate to that at some level, at some personal level, either either presently or in the past. But I think all of us can relate at a national level, right? So normally going into a new year, the people are full of opposition. Not opposition. (laughs) We're full of optimism. We're, we're, We're full of hope for the new year. But 2021 has brought with it its fair share of troubles. And many Americans are discouraged. Discouraged by the state of the republic and the issues ahead of us. And all of us, irregardless of our political persuasion, we all know there's a lot of work ahead of us as a nation. There's a lot of work ahead of us as a church. And I think that we could all agree that we're not seeing the progress that we want to see. And so what do you do when you find yourself discouraged by your circumstances? I want to show you what God tells his people to do when they were discouraged. God gives them one of the most loving and simple set of instructions that to me is probably one of the most beautiful aspects of the book of Haggai 
that it shows the love of God so clearly. Um, do you remember last week? We, we were saying how the people said, we don't know how we're going to build this temple. Uh, we're facing opposition. We really don't know how to. And so God basically gives them a one, two, three plan. It's easy as one, two, three. Just here's number one, go up on the mountain. Number two, you're going to tear down some trees. You're going to rip down some trees, and then you're going to build my temple. Three. One, two, three. That's how easy it is. So just do what I told you to do, and step by step, choose the hard wrong over the easy right. So this week, the people are discouraged. What do we do, God? And watch how loving God is. This is amazing. First, he talked to the governor. Secondly, he talked to the high priest. And then he tells the people all the same thing. Verse 4 of chapter 2. God says, But now, be strong, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. And then he tells Joshua, Be strong. And then he tells all the people of the land, Be strong. What did he tell them to do? Let's all say it aloud. Everybody, he says, Be strong. Be strong. And then he says, and work. Be strong and work. Why? Well, God says it here again. For I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. So what do you and I do when we're discouraged? The first thing that God says to do is to be strong. The second thing that we do, it says right there in the scripture, is to do the work. So can we all say this? Be strong. Be strong and do what? And do the work. So if you're discouraged right now, God says to you, God says to me, be strong and do the work. If you feel like you might give up right now, God says to you and God says to me, be strong and do the work. And listen, the great news is that we don't have to be strong in our own power. The Bible teaches that in my weakness, God's strength is made perfect. I praise God for that. The Bible also teaches us that the same spirit that rose Christ from the dead lives within you and I, his followers. In fact, when you can't do any more and you're about to give up, that's when you are the perfect candidate for God's strength to be strong in you. So what do you do when you're discouraged? You be strong in the Lord, in the power of his might, and you do the work And I want us to notice that the text says to be strong and do the work. It doesn't say to be strong and talk the talk. Be strong and dream the dream. You know, be strong and sit on your couch and wait for the phone to ring. The the, the Bible says to be strong and do the work. And so in this context, God is saying to the people, just put down one more stone. Just put down one more stone. I know you're tired. I know know that you don't know what, you don't see any progress. Just put down one more stone. And I realized that one stone didn't make much of a difference, but be strong and do the work. Put down one more stone. You're not going to see progress. I'm okay with that. You're not seeing progress. I'm fine with that. My word hasn't changed. Your orders haven't changed. Put down one more stone. Keep doing the last thing that I told you to do. Keep choosing the hard right over the easy wrong. Yeah, it'd be easy to quit and go home. It would be easy to just call it quits, you know, kick our feet up and and, and stop the work. But God says to be strong and do the work. For me personally, every time I get into a season or or, or a situation where I'm feeling discouraged, I always go back, I have an image for me and, and I tell myself, lace up your boots, put your helmet on, and keep marching, keep going, keep fighting. And for me, that helps. Just get up, put your boots on, and keep going. I heard a pastor say recently, and I loved it, he said that successful people do consistently what normal people do occasionally. That's good, you should should write that down. Successful people do consistently what normal people do occasionally. So what do you do? You be strong and you keep doing the work. You put down one more stone and then another and then another. And when you feel like giving up, Christian, you be strong and you keep the faith. 
You be strong and you keep praying. You be strong and you do what's right even when you're not seeing progress. If someone just needs to be very practical this morning, be strong and keep exercising even when the numbers are going the wrong direction. Be strong and keep paying off your debt. Even when all you have is $10 extra at the end of the month to put towards the debt, be strong and keep loving the people around you. When they're not loving you in return, be strong and keep sending out the applications even when the phone isn't ringing. Be strong and do your best at work even when it seems like no one is noticing and the whole team is slacking. Be strong and show honor even when those above you are not acting honorably. Be strong and continue to love your spouse when your spouse is unresponsive. Be strong and continue to love your children. Pray for your children. Stand for your children. Fight for your children even when they don't understand your heart. They don't understand what you believe. Be strong and do the work. Galatians chapter 6 verse 9 Verse 9 exhorts us, it says, let us not become weary in what, let's say this aloud, let us not become weary in what? In doing good. In other words, don't become weary in doing the good work because at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not what? If we do not give up, be strong and do the work. And here is the why behind it all. It's there in verse 4. God says to be strong and do the work. Why? For I am with you, declares the Lord. I'm with you. In 2020, in 2021, I am with you. And that's the key to all of it, isn't it? So we can walk into the uncertainty and the discouragement of 2021 and we can lace up our boots and we can put on our helmet and we can keep on marching as long as we know that we're not alone. That God is with us and that we get to join him in the work that he is doing on the earth. And then what God is going to show his people when I read it this week, this, this particular passage, if you've tuned out, tune back in because it just brought me to tears. Um, and I hope that it's encouraging to you. We're going to see what God is doing in the earth at this time. In uh, chapter 2, verses 6 through 9, I want to... Uh, I want to remind you that the people of God could not see what God was doing, right? We've got the benefit of looking back and knowing how the story was going to end. The, the people of God in Haggai's day did not know how things were going to end. So chapter two, verses six through nine. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, can we all say in a little while? In a little while, I will once more Shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations and what is desired by all nations will come. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. God says something that they could not begin to get their minds around. God says that the glory of this house, the glory of this present temple, like the work that you're doing now is going to be greater than the glory of the former. Greater than Solomon's temple? What? God, what are you talking about? That's an, that's, are you feeling okay, God? Right? <laughs> you, you might need to get a, see a doctor. And God says, no. The glory of this present temple, the one that you are working on, the one that you are building right now, is going to be greater than the glory of the former temple. And the, 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 the discouraged people are delusioned by the facts that they see on the ground. The facts that they see with their own eyes and they say, no, it, it just can't be. There, there's no possible way. Even secular historians say that Zerubbabel's temple wasn't even close to the grandeur of Solomon's temple. 
Not even close. So what was God saying? What are you, what are you saying, God? The people had no idea that God was actually foreshadowing the great New Testament truth of his love. You see, all throughout the Old Testament, what happens in the physical is often a picture of what will happen in the spiritual in the New Testament. It's a foreshadow. So God shows us physically what he is going to do, what he will do spiritually. God shows us naturally what he wants to do supernaturally. supernaturally. And here's how it's mind-blowing. God says that the glory of this present temple will be greater than the glory of the former temple. How can you say that? How can you say that? Because God was going to do something that they could not imagine. In Old Testament days, the people had to go to the temple and make a sacrifice in hopes of being right with God. I'll say that again. In the Old Testament days, the people would go to the temple, make a sacrifice in hopes of being right with God. In the New Testament, the new covenant, God says something completely, cra it's crazy. It's unexpected. He said, now, those of you who are followers of Jesus, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Your body is the house where God dwells. And this is mind-blowing. This is out of, this is crazy talk because everybody thought you had to go to the temple to experience God. And now God says, no, wait a second. If you are my follower, G, my follower, if you are a follower of my son, Jesus, I actually dwell in you, and Jesus is the greater glory. Jesus is the greater glory emitting from your life. Now, that changes everything. That changes everything for you and me. Because now that means you don't have to be strong and do the work on your own. Now it means that because God is with you, and not only is he with you, not only is he for you, he is in you. So when you do God's, when you are working on God's behalf, God is working with you. Like you get to be a part of his work. You are a history maker. You're making his story. And the scripture says that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Jesus dwells within you. And the glory of his temple will be greater than the glory of the past. Amen. So every time you put down a stone for his name's sake, you are bringing glory to God. Every time you serve someone, you are glorifying God. Every time you forgive someone, you are glorifying God. Every time you love someone in his name and you share his word, you are glorifying God. And here's why we should not be discouraged. The scripture is telling us that you are not alone. We don't have to go to the temple to make a sacrifice in hopes of finding God, of hopes that he'll forgive us and love us? No, he came to us. And he gave his son so that we might be right with him. Therefore, Jesus dwells within those who are believers and he is the greater glory. So I, I can't be, and, and you can't be discouraged. Joshua 1, 9 says, do not be afraid. It says, do not be discouraged. It's not an option, Christian, follower of Christ. Don't let it happen. It's a choice. I am going to choose to live in the reality that, like we sing today, that I belong to Jesus, that I am his. My circumstances, my circumstances, be what they may, I belong to Christ. He is in me. He is with me. He is for me. So I don't have to be discouraged. I'm not alone. My God is with me in 2021. My God is with you. My God is for you. So be strong, Christian, and do the work. Do the work. That's what the Lord declares. And we know that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. So don't be weary in, in well-doing. Don't become weary in well-doing. For we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. 
If you're discouraged today, I came to remind you that God came to you. That he came to you. He made a sacrifice so that you could be right with him. And he's not only, not only is he just with you, he is in you. And you can do everything, everything that he calls you to do. Church, let's pray. Father, today, give us the courage to put down one more stone. To trust you. To be faithful. To do in your strength and for your glory what you have called us to do. As you reflect in prayer, there are those of you, like me, maybe you kind of got this ongoing, low-grade frustration, especially coming into the new year. Like, I'm not where I thought I would be. We're not where I thought we would be. Uh, you know, I thought, I thought there would be more. You know, I, I'm, not, I'm not doing what I hoped I would be doing. And I'm trying, but I'm just not getting ahead the way I wanted to. And you're not alone if that's you. And I want to inspire you to just do what God showed you to do. Just be faithful. Just be strong. Do the work. Those of you who would say, you know what? Yes, I am discouraged right now. In fact, I've been dealing with a constant discouragement. And I need God's help. I want his strength. I want to be faithful to him. Trusting that he will finish in me what he started. If that's you, can we pray together? Would you just lift your hand? That's me, Josh. I want you to pray with me. Amen. God, I thank you for the people's, I, I thank you for the people who have gathered together expecting to hear from you today. I'm so thankful that you know our hearts, that you know our stories. And I thank you that you're speaking to them today through your word. God, I pray that we would be faithful to the last thing you showed us to do. That we would be strong in you, Lord, and that we would do what you called us to do. God, we thank you that we don't have to do it on our own, but we do it in the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. I, I pray that we would live in that reality. I pray, God, that we would be encouraged because you dwell within those who know your son, Jesus. Be the strength that we need today. Help us to do what you've called us to do. And may Jesus be the greater glory that's received because of our life. As you keep praying today, we talked about doing the work. Do the work. Do the work. Lace up your boots, put on your helmet, and keep marching. Do the work. I'm going to tell you now, don't do the work. What? That's out of left field, Josh. What are you talking about? You do the work when God tells you to do the work, but when it comes to being made right with God, Jesus already did the work. Ephesians chapter 2 says that we are saved by grace through faith and not by works. Not by works. And maybe you grew up going to church thinking, man, I gotta be better, I gotta try harder. I gotta stop doing bad things and, and, and do good things and I'll be good enough for God. And the truth is, there's no way you could ever be good enough for God. Even your smallest sin disqualifies you from heaven. And this is why God, in his love, is, he's just so amazing. Because he didn't make us go to a temple to make a sacrifice, he came to us. He came to me, he didn't shout his love from heaven, he came to earth to show it. And he sacrificed his son, Jesus, the Lamb of God, the final sacrifice, the sinless son of God who died in our place, but he didn't stay dead. He rose from the dead on the third day so that anyone, and this includes you, anyone who calls on the name of Jesus would be saved. All of our sins forgiven, all of, all of your sins forgiven. Maybe you've been building an experience without God, a life without God. And today he's inviting you to experience him personally. There are those of you, you need this right now and you know it. God is coming for you. He loves you. 
He sent his son to die for you and to make you brand new. If this is your time to surrender to Christ, to say yes to him, I want to pray with you. If today's your day, I want to pray with you. Don't miss your moment. If today's your day, raise your hand and we're going to pray with you right now. Heavenly Father, I'm a sinner. Jesus, save me, change me, transform me and make me new. I believe that you died for me so that I could live for you. I thank you for the new life that I have in you. And now you have mine. You have mine. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Listen, if you gave your life to Christ today, we want to hear about it. I want to hear from you. I want to be an encouragement to you. Our church is offering a following Jesus class right now. It's offered in person. Soon we're going to be offering that online to our extended family so that you can take steps from where you are to where God wants you to be. Right now, we're going to worship the King of Kings and Lord of Lords together. Would you stand up with me and let's sing to our Father.
that. We build our life on your love, God. Your love is like no other, God. Thank you for your love each and every day. No matter what we do, that nothing can separate us from who you are, God. put our trust in you as we move forward, God. I just pray that we put our trust in you and we build our lives on your hope and your love and your goodness, God. forget of your love for us, that we can live and walk every day in that freedom, God. Thank you, Lord. We love you. Amen, amen. Well, I pray that this message today spoke to you guys. And if you're joining us online for the first time or you're joining us in person, maybe you've been a follower of Jesus for a while now, or you're just trying to figure out who this Jesus guy is. We are so uh, glad that you could join us today and we are so honored by your presence. I have a few reminders today before we close out. The first is this. So a lot of you guys know that we are in the midst of our Greater Things offering. And what that is, is, you know, we believe that God has called us to tithe, you know, give our first 10%. But we, we say, God, we hear your 10% and we wanna raise you a little bit and sacrifice more of our finances to you. And so we are in the midst of that Greater Things offering. We have one more week to get that in. Um, so I encourage you guys to pray and give as you hear from the Lord. The next is we are having our second year anniversary this upcoming Sunday. We have been, City Light has been up and running strong for two years, so praise God for that. So we are gonna have food, games outside, so please join us. And as, every, you know, as we say every Sunday, make sure to invite someone. Remember, one invitation could change in eternity. Lastly, we are in the midst of our 21-day fast. I know a lot of you guys are fasting. On top of that, we also want to pound on heaven's door and, and cry out to God and just believe that he is going to do some pretty crazy things in our nation and in our world. So we're going to be meeting right over there to pray. We're going to have a guided prayer time um, for 15 to 30 minutes. We're going to see where the Holy Spirit leads us, but we are going to pray over there. So I encourage you guys to join us. If you can't make it, we will see you next week. And I want to remind all of you guys, we are made to shine. So go shine like heaven on earth. Love you guys.